Chapter 13 The Den of Iniquity Even before Uncle Robert got strung out on dope, he was already heavily addicted to pills, weed, drinking, and cocaine when he can get his hands on it. And all at the tender age of 14, making regular visits to the Fred C. Nell's Youth Correctional Facility in Whittier for shoplifting and truancy. Billy, too, struggled with addiction, but not to the degree that Robert did. Billy always held a job, took care of his kids financially, stayed out of jail, and kept his drug use down to coke, a little mescaline, quaaludes now and again, lots of weed, and a bit of drinking. My father didn't use drugs or drink at all, though he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day since he was 12. His addiction was pussy, and he was in no shortage of that, though it could be just as costly and even deadly in its own way. The three of them were brutalized by their father, my grandfather Angelo. After terrifying them throughout their formative years, he died young, leaving them to their own devices in their early teens totally susceptible and exposed to detrimental influences. Without them probably even knowing, they suffered trauma that swayed their behavior in reckless and destructive directions, with little counsel or forethought to guide them. Robert was, by far, the black sheep, though, and ran at his destructive tendencies full throttle and with complete abandon. It started when he was badly burned at work, he fell against some scalding hot pipes when he was an inspector at an oil refinery in Wilmington, one of the few jobs he ever had. He had third-degree burns all over his forearms. His doctor gave him Roxanol, an oral form of morphine, which he took handfuls of to kill the pain. The pain from a bad burn is unbearable, and he couldn't handle it. The pills ran out, and he couldn't get another refill. He got very sick. He wasn't even conscious of what dope sickness was. Then an old friend of his named Vince Delamo came to visit. He had just got back from fighting in Vietnam. He inquired why Robert was so sick. I thought you got burned. I didn't know you were ill, he said. I did get burned. I was taking these pills for the pain, but I ran out and can't get any more. Now I feel terrible. Uncle Robert moaned. Hey, man. Holy fuck! exclaimed Vince, looking at the pill bottle. This is fucking dope. You're dope sick, brother. What the hell are you talking about? asked Uncle Robert, delirious with pain. I'll be right back. I can help you, said Vince, dashing out the door. He came back a half hour later with some works and a bag of a brown, sticky tar substance. He showed Robert how to cook it down in a spoon, drew it up into the syringe, tied off Robert's arm, and dug the needle into one of his plump blue veins. Untying his arm, he sent Robert into more bliss, ecstasy, and inner peace than he had ever known. He was off to the races every day thereafter and every bit of energy he had was spent chasing that feeling. And it was a chase he pursued for 45 years, one that ran roughshod through anyone's life who got in his way, one that led him first to the Norwalk City Jail, the Hall of Justice Jail, where he was locked up with Charles Manson during the Manson Trials, Lincoln Heights Jail, the Twin Towers, a.k.a. L.A. County, Chino State Prison, Susanville, back out on the street, then back to live with my grandmother, staying in the same small room he grew up in with his brothers. He had rarely lived anywhere else, well into his fifties. Most everyone from his past that knew him well had always expressed how disappointing it all was, how he was such a smart, good-looking, and charming devil, and how drugs turned him into a loose cannon, completely unpredictable and untrustworthy. He was usually busted for petty theft charges, possession, and driving while under the influence, but his rap sheet was ten miles long. He didn't care about going to jail after a while, though. He knew he would always have his room at my grandmother's house. Him and his junkie friends would crash there, sometimes stealing my grandmother's social security checks for dope. 
He never helped with chores around the house that my grandmother was too old to do herself. And as a result, the place went to hell. My grandmother would lose control of her bladder sometimes and piss herself, so the carpet smelt like piss. The walls were stained with nicotine. The kitchen floors were greasy. The garage packed with junk that Robert stole or found on the street to sell for drugs. The lawn overgrown. The garden covered in weeds. The ceiling drooping with water damage. A total mess. My father offered a thousand times to kick his ass out on the street, but my grandmother wouldn't let him. He was her firstborn son, and she didn't have the heart to kick him out in that indescribable way that a mother loves her son unconditionally. When I was about 18, Robert got locked up again for an unusually long stretch, doing four years for running a scam he had gotten away with frequently in the past. He'd walk around in Home Depot parking lots looking for receipts that people tossed away. When he found a good one, in this instance, for a new toilet, he'd take it inside, load a new toilet onto a dolly, wander around the store like he was lost, not knowing who to talk to, until someone who worked there asked him if he needed help. He'd then say, Yes, uh, I'm looking to return this toilet. I have a receipt. Is there a return counter, or do I just go through the checkout line? The clerk would direct him to a counter, and Robert would get a full refund for the cost of the toilet. Some cost upwards of $300. They caught him this time, though on a surveillance camera, walking in empty-handed, and followed him around when he pulled the toilet off the shelf. They showed it to the local cops who recognized him right away, went to the house, and dragged him off to jail. And with so many other charges on him, a judge who had had enough of his antics decided to throw the book at him. So he was going away for a long while. My father, who had nothing but contempt for Robert, decided it would be an ideal time to help my grandmother with some badly needed home improvements and started a two-year floor-to-ceiling renovation. He spent two of the last three years of his life working on that house, but when he was done, it was unrecognizable. He rebuilt the roof, recarpeted the living room and my grandmother's bedroom, retiled the bathroom and kitchen, built on an extra room, re-landscaped the front and backyards, and painted the whole place. The only room he wouldn't touch was Robert's. He took me in there one day when I was helping him in the yard. His sheets were stained with sweat, and his end table was covered with a bunch of little smashed up bits of burnt tin foil. There were clothes and garbage all over the floor. The walls were thick with yellow nicotine stains, and upon closer inspection, little sprinkles of some dark red splatters all over the wall next to his bed and on the ceiling. What is that splattered shit all over the walls? I asked. My dad shook his head and said, It's from when he cleans out his syringe. He just squirts the blood all over the walls. I was repulsed by that and the filth all around the room and walked out with my skin crawling. My dad closed the door and never went back in there. Ever. My father died a year or so later. My grandmother not too long after. I remember seeing Robert at her funeral. He was, as he was at my father's funeral, high as a kite. He was literally nodding off in the pew. My Uncle Billy nudged him and walked him outside, where he passed out on the church steps. That was the last time I saw him until that early morning on 2nd Street on my way to work. In spite of Robert and his friends crashing back at my grandmother's house after she died, my Aunt Doll and her husband put the place up for sale. Robert fought tooth and nail to get them to let him stay there, but no one was having that nonsense. He'd have to pack his shit and get the fuck out. Because my father had worked so hard at getting the place nice, they got a great price on it when it sold. They split the money amongst the siblings, but because my father had died, they gave my sisters, Nicole and Michelle, my brother and Vito and I, my father's share, which helped us all immeasurably. Doll and Billy got their shares, and Robert his. And if I had to guess of all of us, Robert went through his money toot sweet, shooting most of it in his arm, blowing what was left on card games, 
the racetrack, shitty cars and apartments, booze, and crazy women. Because to see him all these years later was to see a man on his last legs. He looked like a homeless bum, even though he had a place to live. And what a place it was. After getting kicked out of my grandmother's, he was living in halfway houses and sober living places when he wasn't crashing on friends' couches or living in their garages. He was living in a halfway house on Broadway when he met his girlfriend, Irene. She was an old hippie who had a chronic alcohol problem. If she didn't have booze, her body went into total shock, what's known as delirium tremens, or the DTs, shaking uncontrollably, in a panic, sweating, and willing to do anything for a drink. Robert had shot out all the veins in his arms and was off the dope and on a methadone program, but he still drank, smoked lots of weed, and snorted coke and speed every so often. She was taken with Uncle Robert's charms and moved him into her place. What charms could he possibly have, you might ask? Well, believe me, in spite of all his faults, one thing Uncle Robert was, was charming and smart. I once said to my father when Uncle Robert commented on something about politics at a Thanksgiving dinner, What the hell does Uncle Robert know about anything, the big dummy? To which he responded, Whoa, wait. Uncle Robert has done a stupid thing with his life, but the last thing Uncle Robert is, is dumb. I'd soon come to find that to be true. He'd been living with Irene for five years when we reconnected. The building was right across the street from Tommy's on Broadway liquor store and the Broadway bar right next door to that, both of which they frequented daily. Their apartment was a studio and looked a lot like what Robert's room in my grandmother's house looked like. Trash and fast food wrappers all over the floor, clothing scattered everywhere, dirty dishes in the sink, bathroom dank and moldy, a disgusting mess. The other residents were in just as sorry a state, most of them ex-cons, alcoholics, burnouts, aging terribly, always ripping each other off for smokes, drugs, or what little money they could get their hands on. They were pale and wrinkled and sloppy in their appearance, their speech, their thinking, all broken, all bad, waiting for the bitter end. So suffice to say, Robert and Irene fit right in. They got by on their social security checks and other government programs. Uncle Robert was an expert at scamming the government for assistance. He knew every office, every piece of paperwork, every bureaucratic loophole to get everything the state had to offer. Irene signed on to be Uncle Robert's payee because he was deemed incapable of handling his own finances by a judge who saw a pattern in his spending habits. You give Uncle Robert money, he'll spend the majority of it in a day or two on bullshit. Chips, beer, vodka, weed, smokes, takeout, lottery tickets, card games, as if they were a priority, leaving what was left over, which was usually not enough, for rent and bills. So a payee was to receive his checks and was charged with helping him manage his funds. Not that Irene did. She'd simply receive the check, cash it for him, and hand over the loot. Irene and Robert would often get in fights and she'd kick him out. He'd come sulking over to our place while I was out working, and he and Shasta would get drunk on Dago Red and play chess all day. Chess is one of those games that junkies and ex-cons get real good at from being locked up in jails and detox centers when there wasn't much else to do. I'd come home late from work and find Robert passed out on the couch, snoring like the devil, reeking of booze, and Shasta passed out in her usual spot on her side of the bed in the same condition. I'd be too tired to care, would strip down, brush my teeth, and try to sleep for a few hours before having to go back to the grind. He started coming over every day. We had food in the fridge, after all. An open, airy, clean, sunny apartment. Shasta was better company than Irene, who, while being a sweet-hearted person, 
was also a screeching, stammering drunk, so he took full advantage of Shasta's hospitality. She was just happy to have another old burnout around to gossip, plot, and scheme with, while I was out working all day. As if matters weren't bad enough with the two of them stinking up the joint, Jake and Crow decided to give me a call. I guess they got over being butthurt about me kicking Crow to the curb when he fucked up at our old house. The only reason I answered the phone was because I didn't recognize the number. Crow could never keep a cell phone on for more than a couple months, but always managed to hustle up a burner in some shithole cell phone shop in downtown. They asked me where I was living these days. I couldn't keep it a secret. Though my first instinct was to say, I live on the moon now, you fucking creeps. I folded like a dumb shit and told them where to find me. Maybe just out of the need to have some dudes to hang out with from the bad old days at the American. We made plans to have them come by for a little barbecue. The day they came over was hot and sunny, but the breeze coming off the ocean kept it temperate. Crow and Jake had been on some wild adventures since I had last seen them. Robbing drug dealers, shooting up in abandoned rooms in the American or trying to score clandestine in Salvadorian neighborhoods off of Crow's rival cliques, which was a very dangerous gamble. But anything goes for the divine elixir. Uncle Robert showed up too, looking for a meal or some drugs. We ate and listened to Uncle Robert tell tall tales of his halcyon years, robbing banks back when it was much easier to do so before cameras and computer-triggered alarms, and also yarns about all the lockups he'd been in, which Crow got a kick out of. In a lot of ways, Crow and Robert were very similar creatures. Tall, dark, spooky, preserved, in the way dope sort of freezes you in time. They got along like a house on fire. Jake and Shasta, too. Shasta was an old West Side punk rocker and grew up in Venice, and Jake grew up in Mar Vista and went to Venice High. The drunken, spun-out banter rose through the air with the smoke from the barbecue as the sun sat gently over the whispering sea. I sipped my beer and chewed my food, feeling detached from their rambling, nonsensical blather, thinking of Lourdes, wondering what she was doing over on Naples with the butcher. I longed for the kind of company we kept, our repartee was so entertaining and far more interesting than broken-down old drug stories and street lore, neither of which I could give a fuck about. I also missed Ray. I tried reaching out to him again one day out on the road, to no avail. I felt invisible to the four people sitting around me at the table, like I was on another planet, and in a way I was. There are vast galaxies between the user and the sober. Our house became a modern-day opium den after that. The four of them started crashing the place every day. I'd come home in the middle of the night to find Robert knocked out on the couch. Crow standing on his feet in the dark in front of the TV, bent right in half. His knuckles on the floor knotted out. It was remarkable. He could somehow stand asleep like a fucking horse. Then I'd go into the bathroom and find Jake passed out in the tub, covered in puke, and Shasta spread out on the bed, snoring like a foghorn. They looked like they were having the time of their lives. I'm glad someone was. Uncle Robert showed up one day with a black eye. Irene had another freak out and socked him in the face, followed by throwing his clothes out the window and screaming at him to never come back. He had a trash bag full of his smelly laundry slung over his shoulder, asking if he could stay until things cooled off. I knew it would come to this at some point. My father warned me about Robert years ago and gave me a good set of rules to follow for dealing with him. For starters, he'll always need something from you. Secondly, and most importantly, whatever he says to be true, always believe the opposite. Because he can't help but lie. That's all he does. Lies. Even when there's no need to. But I couldn't turn him away. He was my uncle. 
And even though my father despised him, their mannerisms were eerily similar. The way they spoke, their gestures, even the way they cleared their throats were uncannily the same. It was like my father's ghost had come back to life in some wretched form, haunting me. It made me sad. It made me realize the reason my dad hated him so much was because prior to Robert becoming a complete degenerate, my father probably looked up to his big brother and maybe even wanted to be like him, so much so that he mimicked his behaviors. And though my father hated him, I could still imagine him saying, watch your step with this motherfucker, but help him anyway. He's your uncle. So I let him know he could stay but not permanently. Now you would think that that would go without saying, but one thing I learned with these junky fucks, you had to lay down the law and know in certain terms because they were always looking for a loophole, always looking to hustle to get everything from you they possibly could. What did I care? I was only home about six hours a night. I was a zombie dead inside, gaining more and more weight, not from eating as much as from lack of sleep, stress, and unhappiness. One night in particular brought things to a head. I had the day off, and of course, the whole crew was tilted on a bottle of vodka that Jake had shoplifted from Trader Joe's. He had been on a robbing streak, not because he didn't have money, but for the sheer thrill of it. He and Shasta had gotten pretty brazen about it. They'd go out together and double their haul. There was a new environmental law in Long Beach where grocery stores couldn't sell plastic bags anymore. So most people would buy canvas bags to reuse. So Jake and Shasta would simply walk in with empty canvas bags in their cart, stuff the bags with items right off the shelf, and would walk out the door without paying, as if they had just went through checkout. They got away with a feast this time. Lobster tails, three packs of sausages, mashed potatoes, mixed salads, three different kinds of ice cream, a 12-pack of beer, four bottles of wine, chips, pistachio nuts, almond butter, goat cheese, a bag of frozen chicken breasts, two boxes of cereal, and Mona's favorite dog treats. They started cooking in the kitchen and pouring the booze. They blasted the stereo loud and laughed as Uncle Robert danced around the room, saying, You guys can't go stealing when you're sick, baby. You gotta get your mojo. Get a nice shot in your arm and go in there cool, baby. Crow, Jake, and Shasta were rolling. Uncle Robert sounded like a pimp in a bad 70s black exploitation film. As the sun went down and the bottles emptied out, the blather ensued. There are few things I despise more than rambling, drunken nonsense. They slurred and ranted and talked over each other, saying nothing. Their revelry, false, drug-induced, their brains lacking oxygen, making them giddy, when all the while they were miserable, lost, shiftless, broken. They pontificated on about their clever schemes, their brilliant ideas, their big plans to start fresh and stick to a new schedule, disciplined, driven, getting clean once and for all, taking care of business. When in reality, they'd be sick by morning, looking for a way to hustle a fix so they could sleep, forget, get lost in their dreams. It was sickening. I went to my room to write. I closed the door and locked it. I sat down and started typing out some poems, playing some soft music to drown out the slobbering, slurred laughter and horseshit piling up outside my door. At some point, Shasta noticed I was gone and tried to come in the bedroom to find me. She rattled at the locked door, screaming, Christian! What the fuck? Let me in. What the fuck are you doing in there? I'm just writing for a bit. I'll come out in a little while. 
Not that I had any intention of going back out there, but I figured she'd forget in a few minutes and would leave me be. Fuck that, she screamed. Let me the fuck in right now, motherfucker. I heard Jake then. Yeah, Christian, let us in. Let us in! (laughs) He screamed insanely. What could they possibly want? They had my living room, the food, the music, their drugs and booze. Why do they need me there, too? Suddenly, I heard a crunching, pounding noise. I looked over my shoulder to see the wood around the doorknob being bashed in and a big hunk of steel smashing through. Shasta had taken one of my 25-pound dumbbells and smashed through the door. What in the flying fuck are you doing, you crazy cunt? I screamed. I told you to let me in! Shasta screamed back at the top of her lungs. She was stumbling drunk and cross-eyed. Jake stood behind her, laughing uncontrollably. That was all I could take. I felt a rage welling in me that I didn't know I was capable of. I ran at her full speed. She and Jake saw the fury in my eyes and ran back out into the living room with me in hot pursuit. That's it. All you fucking scumbags get the fuck out of my place now before I start flying fucking heads. Crow and Jake, who had seen and felt the weight of my rage before, hightailed it out the door first. Uncle Robert started gathering his clothes and socking them into a trash bag and scurried out after them. Shasta stood there staggering, trying to stay on her feet. You're just going to kick your friends and your own fucking uncle out on the fucking street? I always suspected you were an asshole, Christian. Now I know it. I've never been more miserable in a relationship in my whole life. Life. You're terrible. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was terrible? Maybe she felt rejected sexually. Maybe I wasn't even affectionate. And maybe she could feel my disdain for her lifestyle or my disgust at her appearance. Maybe it showed in my face when I looked at her, in spite of my trying to hide it. But terrible? I'd done nothing but work to pay my end of the rent and bills and left her and the rest of them to their business, saying nothing about it and minding my own. First of all, you fucking twat, this is not a relationship. And in case you weren't aware, you and these fucking nut jobs are the terrible ones. The way you live your lives is fucking disgusting. And my uncle? What the fuck do you know about my uncle? Nothing, you cunt. You have no idea the kind of shit he's capable of. So yeah, I'm kicking him and them to the fucking curb. And if you want to join them, be my guest. Because if you don't get into detox and then rehab soon, you're fucking gone. She just stood there, silently swaying, trying to stay upright. She knew what I was saying was true and had no response. I went back in the room and shut off the lights and got in bed. I had to be up in a few hours for work. I woke up a few hours later and went into the bathroom to take a shower. I looked in the toilet and saw that Shasta must have had a piss and in her inebriated state forgot to flush. The piss was a murky yellow and smelt strongly of bologna. I wanted to fucking puke. It made me ill all morning, so much so I couldn't stomach breakfast and didn't eat all day until I got off work. When I got home, Shasta was sitting on the couch, looking very sick. I I haven't shot up today. I'm ready to go into detox. I want to go now. Can you take me, please? You're right. I need to get off this shit before it kills me. I suddenly felt terrible. She was making a big effort, 
I was totally aware of that. I hugged her and helped her pack a bag and drove her to a detox center in North Long Beach called the Redgate Memorial Recovery Center. Like all the detox centers I had seen, it looked run down and dreary. I gave her a hug and she went in and got checked into a room. I drove away feeling heartbroken. I knew what she was in for and knew that it was none too pleasant. I went back to the apartment, threw all the empty bottles away, cleaned all the dirty dishes, cleaned the toilet and the bathtub, made the bed, vacuumed, took out the trash, sprayed the place down with air freshener, and fell asleep with melancholia surging through my brain. I hoped that things would get better, but I had my doubts. A normal stay in a detox center is two to three weeks. Then they will recommend a rehab. You can end up in a rehab for anywhere from a month to eight weeks in most cases. Then they usually recommend a sober living house after that and an outpatient treatment plan with lots of meetings with an N.A. group to keep you straight in the meantime. It's a lot of work, and it takes a lifetime of commitment to get off and stay off. At the end of about seven days, Shasta called and asked me to pick her up. Are you sure? It doesn't seem like you've even begun to get better. How can you trust yourself to stay clean? I asked. Oh, I've been through this a lot. I know I can stay clean once I go through withdrawals. That's the hardest part. After that, I can deal. I'm good, so come get me. I miss Mona. You've never seen the sober me. I'm a whole different person. We'll get along a lot better, trust me. Now, knowing what I did about withdrawal, I knew that there was no way she was over the hump. But what could I do? Maybe the withdrawal was different for some people and she felt like she could keep it together. I couldn't leave her there. She still paid half the rent, and she had every right to come back if she wanted to. So I picked her up later that day. She did seem more energetic and present. She complained that the food at the detox was terrible, so I took her to Round Table Pizza and bought us a large pie with everything on it. She was ravenous and ate more than half of it. When we got home, she took a hot shower, got in bed, and fell fast asleep. I could tell she had been through a lot. Things started seeming normal around the house. The night I kicked Crow and Jake out, Jake got stopped and was arrested for driving under the influence. They somehow didn't bother running Crow's name and let him go. He disappeared back into Skid Row. Uncle Robert somehow convinced Irene to take him back. So it was just Shasta and I. I'd come home from work and she'd have dinner ready for me, which I found astounding. She never had before, even once. But I could see something in her eyes. She was bored, craving the thrill of the score, the prick of the needle, the flooring rush of dopamine flooding her brain. Before too long, she cracked. One day off, I was making myself a plate of food. I offered Shasta some of what I made, but she said she wasn't hungry. She seemed hyper and cagey. She went in the bedroom and was talking to someone on her cell for about 15 minutes. She came out bouncing and full of glee. Hey, Veronica and Bill want to go to the Lighthouse Museum to see the Korean Bell. You want to go with? Veronica and Bill were a couple of old junkie friends of hers from the South Bay. She introduced us once, and I didn't like them at all. They had been strung out for years, and it showed... Their teeth were rotted out, they were skin and bones, and had but a few marbles rolling around in their heads. No thanks, not my idea of a good time, I sneered. Well, is it okay if we take Mona? I agreed to it. Shasta did love Mona to death, and Mona loved running around up there. She put Mona on her leash and grabbed her purse, and away they went. I was happy to have the place to myself for a while and relax. About 45 minutes later, my cell phone rang. I didn't recognize the number and thought it might be Crow trying to sneak me a call. I decided to pick up, and if it was Crow, I was going to tell him to stay the fuck away. But it wasn't Crow. It was the Long Beach Police Department.
Yes, Mr. Pasquale, uh, we have your girlfriend here at the 7-Eleven on the corner. She was shooting heroin in the parking lot, and she's going to jail. She wants you to come get the dog. I was fucking gobsmacked. I don't know why I should have been, but it was shocking nonetheless. My main concern was getting Mona home. As for Shasta, I couldn't care less if I tried at this point. I put on a shirt and shoes and walked down to the corner. There was an inordinately numerous amount of patrol cars in the parking lot. I saw Veronica and Bill standing by the front door of the 7-Eleven looking stupid and pathetic, and Shasta in the back of one of the patrol cars, grinding her teeth and shaking her head, glaring at me with her glassy eyes, saying, Sorry. <laughs> Fucking sorry, man. The cops started eyeballing me. They scanned their flashlights across my eyes and down my arms, looking for gang-related tattoos. One of the female officers brought Mona over on her leash and handed her over. Did you know your girlfriend's a heroin addict? Asked one of the male cops. She's not my girlfriend, I replied. Okay, did you know your friend is addicted to heroin? I didn't reply. The thing about cops... You just don't give them anything other than your name, and then it's time to zip your lip. They want you to say anything to incriminate yourself, so it's always best to clam up. Are you on heroin? They asked. Can I go now? I replied. Yeah, go ahead, but your girlfriend's going to jail tonight. She's not my girlfriend, I said, carrying Mona down the street. I heard Shasta yelling, can you take my car back home? Christian, can you take the car? I didn't reply. I didn't even look back. I was done, and I had to figure out what I was going to do next. I got home and paced around the room, not knowing what steps to take. A couple hours later, I called Lourdes to tell her what happened and asked her what she thought I should do. She was as shocked as I was though I had kept her abreast of everything that had been going on, from reconnecting with Uncle Robert, to Crow and Jake crashing my apartment, to the lot of them getting high every day, to Shasta's baloney piss. Well, that seals it, Christian. You have to kick that cunt out and get a new roommate or a cheaper place. This is fucking crazy. She was right. I thanked her and hung up. I was just about to get online to get the number for the jailhouse when I heard an earth-shattering blast against the front door that shook the entire building, then loud shouting, Long Beach PD, search warrant! Mona went running into the living room, barking and growling. I ran after her to stop her. When I came into the living room, I was stopped in my tracks, blinded by little laser beams of red light. I looked down to see the center of my chest lit up with the same deadly little beams. There were eight cops, twice my size, in full riot gear, with the sights of their forty caliber sidearms trained about my head, neck, and chest. Get the fuck down, motherfucker! Down on the fucking ground! They screamed. Before I could comply with their commands, two of the biggest cops ran across the room, grabbed me, kneed me in the solar plexus, and slammed me into the carpet, hard, torqued my arms behind my back, and cuffed me. The shock and awe of their attack, and the sheer trauma of them slamming their knee into my stomach, caused me to fart. One of the cops stood over me, waving the stench away from his face, and said, Fuck, you stink, asshole. The rest of them laughed as they peeled off their helmets and face masks. <sighs> Is there a problem, officers? <sighs> was the only thing I could think to say. I was looking around the room for Mona, but couldn't find her. She had run into the bedroom and hid under the bed. My thoughts were with her. The poor little thing didn't deserve this. Then the sergeant came in the room. He picked up one of my magazines off the coffee table and started thumbing through it. So... You and your girlfriend slinging dope out of here, cocksucker? He asked as he perused around the room. We got a hold of Shasta's phone and she has text saying, Can you get us a bag for 20 bucks? 
What are we supposed to think? I could not, I repeat, could not believe what I was hearing. What? I exclaimed. Do I look like I'm fucking balling around here? I replied, referring to the austere and plain decor. Look, man, she's not my girlfriend. We're just roommates. I'm a truck driver and work all day and most of the night. If she's up to some shit, I don't know the first thing about it. And if she is selling and holding out, let me know, because she owes me about $30 for cigarettes. The cops all laughed again. Look at my license. It's Class A. Call my bosses. They'll tell you. The cop seemed compassionate. Well, I tend to believe you, but we're still going to tear the place apart, said the sergeant, giving the rest of them the nod to start their search. And man, did they know a thing or two about fucking places up. The kitchen was first, tearing open all the cereal boxes, pouring it all over the floor. Same with the chips, the minute rice, the ice cream in the fridge, shoveled out of their containers into the sink. Then they went through the closets and tossed all the clothes around the room into the dresser drawers where they found my three fifty seven Magnum. They asked me about it. I told them it was registered. If you went for that gun, you'd be dead right now, one of the cops just had to point out. I just kept my mouth shut. They flipped over the mattress and found nothing except for Mona, who came running out and sat next to my face, whining and shaking. I was fucking furious. That lousy cunt almost got me killed. They didn't find anything. I heard them run my name and the radio calling in and saying I didn't have a record. They uncuffed me and let me sit on the couch. Mona jumped up on my lap. I held her shaking body and tried to calm her. Sorry we had to do this, man, but we asked Shasta if we could search the place and she told us to go fuck ourselves. That made us think she had something to hide. I was seeing red. This didn't have to happen. This piece of shit was on the fast track to hell. It was time to get out of the way and let her pass. Bone voyage, you cunt. <laughs>